Hi, I'm Ed Sperling, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Quentin Hall of Xilinx, who's going to talk today about safe and robust machine learning for the edge. So Quentin, when you think about machine learning, this is so, so new in terms of the actual rollout. We've compressed this into probably, what, five years of a very long history for semiconductors. How do we make sure that this actually is safe and secure and also does all the things that you're supposed to be doing with uh, machine learning? You know, I think there's a long legacy of, of ML research work that has been done. Many companies that have been very focused on research. But when you consider the problem of actually deploying these models in the real world, there are many factors, you know, things that, that we, may not, uh, we may not consider to be fundamentally obvious, whether those issues are visual perturbations that cause the, uh, the neural network to make a misprediction or, um, you know, security considerations that, that relate either to the actual deployed mo model or uh, you know, in fact, to the, the training data set that is leveraged and the access that is, is potentially available to, you know, those that might want to kind of disrupt the ideal result from, from these types of um, implementations. What are you really, to try, really trying to accomplish when you get to the edge? The edge is sort of a new concept in and of itself. And it arose largely because it's too expensive in terms of resources to move data back and forth to the cloud. That ultimately, the, the data that we want to process, that we want to make inferences on, resides at the edge. And um, you know, this is because these, the sensors, um, the, the information that we're trying to analyze is taking place at, in some location, which might very well might be a remote location from where the you know, centralized command and control might take place in a typical system. And so you know, I think what you're speaking to really is this, is this problem of the, the, the need to be able to react very quickly to data insights. Um, that is to say, you know, from a safety perspective, for instance, to be able to take action um, very, very quickly and uh, you know, also there's, you know, the potential problem that, that exists that relates to um, the, you know, the, the cost of bandwidth, the cost of storage, all of those types of things that when we're looking at the cloud edge trade-off, we have to consider all of these factors. And, you know, part of the result of this has been that there has been, you know, much higher adoption of machine learning inference in edge devices over the course of the last few years. Let's drill down into this. Sure. Quentin, what are we looking at here? Ed, Ed what we're looking at here is, is really a set of considerations that relate to AI safety. And these, these are very high level considerations that any developer must look at as they're beginning to think about deploying AI models or ML models in their devices. And this, this is without regard to whether this is the edge or the cloud or anywhere for that matter. And you know, really, these are a few questions that one must ask themselves. So, you know, first of all, does the system actually behave according to our intentions? Well, what are our intentions? There are intentions that perhaps we code in C or that we implement in hardware. Um, there are also intentions that relate to the AI model predictions. The AI model is not necessarily going to make the same prediction every time that we as a human would want it to. And so this is, this is a challenge that we do need to, to address at a system level in order to ensure that the, the model is behaving as per what the human would ultimately perceive is, is required in a specific circumstance. Um, in terms of perturbations, so you know, can the system withstand perturbations? Now, what are perturbations? These could be, you know, things as simple as you know a fleck of dust on the on the camera. This this could be uh, in the context of a road sign. This could be some damage uh, to the road sign that was you know caused by uh, uh, you know a, a bullet or something else that struck the sign and removed some of the paint from it. You know, does the AI still recognize that sign as, as being a sign? 
And then, you know, a, a kind of a, a fundamental level, at, or maybe at a high level, I guess we, we should say, we have to really consider the, from a system perspective, how we can analyze what the artificial intelligence algorithm is doing and, and monitor what it is, the decisions and the choices that it is making. And, you know, I mean, this, if this sounds a little bit Isaac Asimov-y, there's a reason for this, obviously. We, we need to, ultimately, we need to be able to control um, how our devices, how our machinery, how our equipment is operating and the decisions that it's making. And we need to be able to shut it down in any case where we are uh, in a situation where we're uncertain or where the AI model predictions um, maybe directing us to, or, you know, suggesting uh, that, you know, that the situation is not as it, as it actually seems. So there, there needs to be these real world controls and this analysis and monitoring of the algorithms. And you're bringing up a really interesting point, which is that when you're designing an ML chip, it really is part of a much larger system, right? Yes, that is, that is correct, absolutely. It's, it's, it's part of a system and as well as part of an environment. And, you know, the, those, those two factors influence what we can allow the, the, the model to do or, or what we can allow the AI to do in the context of these systems. And also, you know, the types of controls and testing that we have to have in place to ensure the robustness. One of the challenges with a AI ML is that this is also new. How do we make sure that when you verify these chips that they're going to work as you expected them to? Um, from a systems engineering perspective, one of the, the key care abouts or one of the key goals is, is verification. And that occurs at, at a hardware level, that occurs at a systems level, that occurs at, you know, at an application level in terms of the code that we write. And from a systems perspective, there are many longstanding techniques that have been developed to deal with these types of problems. So for instance, if we consider the context of you know, C, C++ code in uh, safety critical applications, you know, one technique that has been used uh, for many years in order to ensure compliance or to ensure safety has been to, for every line of code, you write another line of code that verifies that that particular line of code. And in the context of, of uh, programmable logic design or IC or ASIC design, uh, we perform uh, you know, timing simulations that are accounting for all of the different variables in terms of process, temperature, and so forth. But when you consider an algorithm that has been trained on a massive amount of data and that uh, an algorithm which does not necessarily uh, make uh, predictions that are 100% accurate, you know, how, how do you perform that verification process? So there are, there are many different factors that are involved in this. And, you know, over the course of the past several years, particularly as um, artificial intelligence and in particular deep learning has moved out of the, you know, shall we say research community into the productization or production community, this has become a, a point which is much more interesting and important. And, and so when we start to look at you know, how this is implemented, we, we very quickly realize that it is, it is nigh on impossible or it feels nigh on impossible to actually perform this verification. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this and I'm not going to walk through every bullet that is on this particular slide. But there is a very significant body of research that has been led uh, in particular by some specific researchers in the community that is targeted towards neural network verification in order to ensure that the neural networks are making accurate predictions and that they are behaving as per our intentions, which is you know, one of the, the topics that I mentioned earlier. Is it enough to verify as part of the design forward? Do you really have to now think about verification as a continuous thing because you have to monitor what this device is doing over its lifetime? 
I think there's there's several points that that you've actually brought up. So one is one is the question of of verification in uh, in a real real world application. So you know it's one thing to say that mathematically an algorithm is making correct predictions. It's an entirely different thing uh, to show that the algorithm is behaving in a robust fashion in a real world application. And you know, we've seen indications over the course of you know, several, the last several years that there are behaviors that uh, you know, clearly were not expected from you know, some of these, these ML algorithms. And you know, there's a number of different examples in the press uh, related to that. So that's one piece of it. Um, the, the second piece is as it relates to the system as a whole. And, and that is also a very important question because this the system unto itself is only ro as robust as the fashion in which it is leveraging the AI predictions. And similarly, the AI model itself is only as robust as the system that it resides in. So, you know, that ties into that ties into security, that ties into the, you know, issues such as error, error detection and correction um, in a lot of applications. So yes, there's absolutely, there's a lot of factors there. So security is a big problem when it comes to machine learning because you now are dealing with code and how you protect it over time. So you've got to make sure that you have the integrity of the code and that it is exactly yes. what you started out with and what you expect to end up with, right? Ed, this is absolutely the question of the day. So when you consider real world deployments for machine learning, more often than not, the data sets that are leveraged are private data sets. They're data sets that are curated, that are labeled internally by companies. In, in some cases under, you know, very close lock and key, uh, you know, with it, you know, carefully guarded encrypted servers. In, in other cases, though, companies are contracting the labeling of, uh, of their data. They're contracting out the development of the machine learning models. And in other cases, we're leveraging open source data sets that are found on the web. And, you know, as, as a very classic example, you know, if you consider, for instance, the image net data set, um, you know, which was trained on a thousand different classes of images and, you know, is commonly used as a benchmark or for demonstrations, there are so many images in that data set uh, that it is virtually impossible for somebody to go through and verify that every label is correct. It is actually feasible to perturb an image with random noise, or it's actually not random noise, uh, to perturb that image in a way that is imperceptible to humans, but in a fashion that will cause neural networks to make an incorrect prediction. And so, you know, this, this discovery obviously has had very widespread implications, um, all the way from being able to leverage neural networks in order to generate realistic images, but also it's had an impact on how companies have to, how they have to secure and how they have to process their data uh, in terms of storage, data labeling, and, and so forth. And that's one of the big concerns right now, right? Because if, even if you do minor tweaks into the data, it has a much bigger effect downstream and you don't necessarily see how that's going to happen until you start seeing these devices behave in the real world and also as machines start training machines. You bring up a very valid set of points. This is, uh, you know, this is an example, I guess, of the, the types of problems that, you know, the industry is facing. Um, you know, if, if we look at how companies approach machine learning um, particularly, you know, companies that are either too small to develop internal resources or who are dealing with um, very large data sets and who are, uh, you know, not explicitly developing their own machine learning expertise internally. We, you know, we end up with a process that looks a little bit like what you see on this slide here, 
which is you know really a situation in which outsourcing can potentially lead to a situation in which a bad actor, a person wishing to disrupt or in some other fashion provide themselves with a back door into the system, can actually tamper with the data. So how do we make sure as you go through this and you really get some knowledge about these devices and how to, how to develop them, how do you make sure that this gets transferred on? If, if somebody had inserted into ImageNet, they had inserted some poison data. If we train, you know, train a model using ImageNet, then obviously our model is susceptible to those problems. If we use the, the concept of transfer learning is when we take the pre-trained weight values from a trained neural network and we transfer those weight values uh, without retraining, completely retraining the network from scratch. And, and once we've transferred those weight values, we retrain with a new data set. And so conceptually, kind of the idea is this, like if you train a, if you train a neural network based on ImageNet, it learns how to see shapes, colors, patterns, textures. Now, if you, if you then transfer those weight values to, uh, to a, a network and then just use a very small data set, let's say, you know, a thousand images or something like that to train it to detect stop signs, it doesn't need to relearn all of those basic features. So that's the concept of transfer learning. Now, the problem is this concept of data poisoning also transfers. So if, if somebody has inserted a back door into a neural network through data poisoning, the, the result of this is the back door is transferred as well. Looking out to the future, how do we know these systems are going to work as we expected them to? That's really what this is all about, right? It is, yes, yes. It, it is. How do we ensure that these, these systems mimic ideal human behavior? How do we ensure that, that they make the appropriate decisions to turn themselves off or to, um, you know, otherwise prevent, you know, harm or, you know, safety occurrences, those types of things. And, you know, from a, from a high level that, that relates to obviously the integrity of, of, of the code at a systems level, but it also relates to, in, you know, in many cases, things like, um, you know, simple things like ECC on DRAM um, or, you know, the potential of running multiple processors in lockstep in order, in order to ensure that the systems are, are robust and operational under all circumstances. Quentin Hall, thanks for a great explanation. Well, thank you, Ed. I really appreciate your time.